Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, Serious Security uh, Seminar at Purdue University. Uh, today it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hao Chen from uh, uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, <clears throat> professor Chen is a uh, assistant professor in the computer science department at UC Davis. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in computer science from uh, UC Berkeley in 2004. Uh, his research interest is in uh, computer security with an emphasis on wireless security, web security, and uh, software security. Uh, in 2007, uh, Professor Chen uh, received the uh, NSF uh, Korea Award uh, to support his research in wireless security. Oops, oh, anyway. <laughs> thanks, Tomia. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, so this talk describes um, a project that's supported by uh, the NSF Career Award. So the goal of the project is to um, identify unique vulnerabilities in cellular data networks. So we have been looking at vulnerabilities on the internet for a decade. And we think that we know more or less the vulnerabilities there. But as computing moves to the cellular data networks, what new vulnerabilities are there? And uh, how can we um, deal with these new vulnerabilities? Um, this particular work focuses on the scheduling algorithm in the third generation cellular data networks. And this is a joint work with uh, my student, Radmilo Rasik, and um, uh, Dennis Ma and my colleague, Xin Liu, at uh, UC Davis. The third generation um, cellular data networks provide a high-speed uh, downlink, downlink data access. Uh, for example, there are two um, example technologies. One is called uh, HSDPA, uh, high-speed downlink packet access. The other one is called the EVDU, um, evolution data optimized. Um, H HSDPA is being deployed by uh, some US major uh, wireless cellular carriers in major cities. Okay, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, HSDPA is being deployed. Um, the reason why they can offer high speed downlink data access is that uh, they exploit the multi user diversity. So, my multi user diversity means that. Uh, um, your cell phone's channel condition varies, depends on its location and the time. Okay. Uh, there might be some interference, such that uh, suddenly your channel condition gets bad. And when you move to a bad area, such as inside an elevator or a corner, your channel condition might also get bad. However, um, chances are that at any given time, a subset of cellular devices have relatively good channel condition. And this is, this is the basic intuition behind multi-user diversity. Uh, you might think that uh, multi-user diversity is a bad thing because new cell phone can get a uh, stable channel condition. But rather than uh, fighting against it, um, people have tried to embrace multi-user multi diversity to improve the, thresh, uh, the throughput of a cellular data system. And this is achieved by, um, an algor by algorithms called opportunistic scheduling. Um, so let me give you um, some brief background on um, um, multi-user um, diversity. Um, so in a typical opportunistic scheduling algorithm, the base station uses time division multiple access to divide a channel into time slots. Okay, they chop the, the, um, the time into different slots. And each uh, slot is about uh, 2 milliseconds in HSDPA and 1.67 milliseconds in the uh, EVDO. Uh, this is called the transmission time interval. So the assumption be behind uh, opportunistic scheduling is that uh, each cell phone's channel condition changes independently, okay, both uh, in time and in location. However, at any given moment, some varying sets of cell phones have relatively good channel conditions. Therefore, opportunistic scheduling tries to embrace this multi-user diversity by asking every cell phone 
to report its channel condition at every um, time slot. So once the base station receives the channel condition reports from all cell phones, the base station will schedule, um, will pick a cell phone with a relatively good channel condition to be scheduled in the next time slot. Um, among all the algorithms for doing um, opportunistic scheduling, a very common algorithm is called the proportional fair algorithm. Um, when you, once you do scheduling, you have to strike a balance between maximizing the system throughput and uh, uh, reducing the delay. Right? If you just want to maximize the system throughput, you always want to schedule uh, the cell phone with the best channel quality. But if you always do that, then some cell phones with bad signal qu channel quality would starve for could be forever. So you always want to strike a balance. And in particular, this proportional fair scheduler tries to strike a balance by maximizing the product of the throughput of all the users. Um, here is the particular scheme used by this uh, scheduling, um, scheduling algorithm. So uh, the base station tries to, maxima to maximize this value. Um, the numerator of this value is the instant, instantaneous channel, qu channel quality of a particular cell phone user I. The denominator is the average uh, throughput of the same user. Um, uh, as I just described, there are two values. One is the instantaneous channel quality. The other is the average throughput of the same user. And the average throughput of the user is calculated using a sliding window. Okay, this is your typical sliding window ca uh, calculation. Um, if the user I is scheduled at that, at that time slot, then uh, its average throughput is, is increased uh, by the sliding window. If that user is not scheduled at that time slot, then its average throughput is, decay is decayed by uh, a factor of 1 minus uh, alpha. Okay, so much for the background on uh, proportional fair scheduler. So what vulnerabilities did we find? Well, we found two vulnerabilities. The first is that um, at each time slot, every cell phone reports its channel condition to the base station. But the base station does not verify the authenticity of the channel condition report. And in fact, it's very hard for the base station to verify the channel condition because one has to measure the channel, channel condition at the location of the cell phone. Since the base station could be far away from the cell phone, it's not feasible for the base station to, to, uh, to verify the channel condition reported by the cell phone because the cell phone could be hiding behind um, a metal shield or inside an elevator, and there's no, no way that the base station can know that information. Another problem with proportional fair algorithm is that um, even though pr 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 proportional fair guarantees fairness, the fairness is only guaranteed inside a cell. Once a cell phone moves to different cells, the fairness is no longer guaranteed. And I'll show you um, in a moment how this can be exploited by uh, attackers. So one fundamental um, reason behind these vulnerabilities is that uh, cellular networks were designed with the assumption that all the cellular phones are trusted. Um, so this probably uh, is um, an artifact um, carried over from the traditional um, landline um, telephone designs. In the traditional landline telephone systems, a telephone device is, is issued to you by the your telephone company, and there's not much that the telephone can do ex besides dialing numbers. So uh, attack is not really a concern there. However, um, as we have more, as we move to the cellular networks, and as we have more and more sophisticated uh, cell phones, uh, for example, iPhones, there are a lot of things you can do with your cell phone. 
Well, the secondary providers love this because this means that uh, they can push a lot of functionalities into your cell phone, which means that uh, there are, um, the equipment at the network, at the base stations, can be simplified. All right, this is a good news for the equipment manufacturers. But in terms of security, this is a big warning sign. Because once you cannot trust the cellular devices, you have to decide uh, um, of everything that the device has told you, the network, what do you have to verify and how you can verify those information. OK, um, so I have told you the um, vulnerabilities. Are this, these vulnerabilities real? In other words, can an attacker take advantage of these vulnerabilities to attack the network? I'm going to show, I'm going to show you one particular attack. So the goal of this attack is to hoard as, as many time slots as possible by the malicious uh, cell phone. So uh, the cell phone could launch this attack for two different reasons. The first reason <coughs> is, uh, is, is being selfish. Okay. Uh, you want to get as many slots as possible. For example, if you are downloading um, 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 the latest uh, video, sorry, I mean, I mean the latest kernel of Linux. Um, um, and um, this is the first reason. The second reason is that um, um, if you really want to disrupt a cellular network, then you want to shut off every other user from the system. Now. Um, Increasingly, cell phones are used for emergency response purposes. And there's a trend that a voice is being carried over through the data channel. If you can shut everyone off the data network, then chances are that in the future, they may not even be able to con contact the emergency services like 911. So that'll be a big problem. Regardless of their intentions, the attacker just wants to grab as many scheduling slots as possible. Um, and we have devised a two-tiered attack. Um, so the, the first tier is to exp the first uh, tier attack is called the intracell attack. So which means that uh, the attacker stays in the cell. So this attack exploits the unverified channel condition report by cell phones. In order to increase the effectiveness of the attack, we designed a second tier attack, where uh, this attack spans more than one cell. And this attack exploits um, the handoff procedure of cell phones. Okay, I'm going to tell you um, how each of the attacks work. But before I tell you attack, let me uh, make my threat model explicit. So th a threat model tells you what we um, consider as threats and what we do not consider as threats. So we assume that the attackers control a few cell phones. And these cell phones have been um, legitimately admitted into a network. For example, the attacker could have spread malware onto cell phones. So that the malware will, will execute according to the attacker's intention. And also, um, if the attackers um, doesn't have malware, then attackers can simply go out and buy some prepaid um, data cards. Okay. There are very popular, so cellular data, um, prepaid data cards are very popular in Asia and Europe. And uh, I saw that they have already become available in, in major US cities. Okay. So by this way, you can attack the network without being identified because, because you pay cash for uh, the prepaid card. And uh, we also assume that the attackers can modify the cell phone, perhaps the software or even, uh, or even the, the, the firmware to modify the way that cell phones report channel conditions and cell phone, the way cell phones request the hand, handoffs. However, we do not assume that the attackers can um, penetrate the cellular networks. Okay, so this attack was um, launched entirely from a cell phone. Okay, it does not, um, it does not um, penetrate the cellular network. Um, so in our first um, attack, we assume that the attacker knows the channel condition of every other cell phone in the network. You might think that this is an unreasonable assumption. Uh, yes, it is an unreasonable assumption. But I'm going to uh, show you later how this assumption can be relaxed. 
once the attacker knows the channel condition of all the other cell phones in the network, then his attack strategy becomes very simple. Uh, if you recall from the uh, previous slide, the base station selects the um, the self. Can you see my mouse? Okay. The base station selects a, a cell phone to schedule, such that the scheduled cell phone has the maximum value, okay, the maximum ratio between its instantaneous rate, um, um, data rate and its average throughput. So therefore, the attacker simply calculates its instantaneous channel um, channel quality indicators such that its ratio is the is a maximum is, is the maximum among all the cell phones, and then it reports that channel condition indicator to the base station, and the base station will sch will schedule it. Okay, very simple. And here's our simulation results. So we have a, a cell of 50 users, and we um, um, we let between one to five of the users to be attackers, and we measured how many continuous time slots that the attackers can get using the attack strategy that I showed in the last slide. Um, as you can see, that um, if there's one attacker the attacker can get 20 continuous time slots. Whereas if there are five attackers, then they may get um, about 100 time slots. But think, but think about it. This is not really very impressive. Because if you recall, uh, a time slot in HSDPA is only 2 milliseconds. So 20 time slots is about uh, um, 40 milliseconds. And even 100 time slots is about, uh, um, about 200 milliseconds. Okay, that's less than a minute. Yes, yeah, so you can get the attackers can get this like less than a second, all to itself. But that this doesn't really affect other mobile devices a lot. Okay, there, there's a jitter, but that's it. So this attack cannot continue. So the next question is that uh, how can we uh, um, improve this attack? Is it possible to per perpetuate this attack? And we discovered that, yes, you can do this. And here's how you do it. Uh, remember that proportional fair guarantees fairness only within the single cell. In other words, within the single cell, once a, a cell phone gets scheduled, its average throughput will increase, but its ratio will decrease the ratio between its instantaneous um, data rate and its average data throughput will decrease, which means that uh, once a cell phone gets scheduled, it will have a lower scheduling priority in the future at future time slots. However, proportional fare does not carry over um, across different cells. Once a cell phone hands over to a different cell, its average throughput is forgotten. Therefore, um, the cell phone can start over again with a very low uh, throughput. And um, based on this observation, you can design the following scheme to attack the network perpetually. Suppose the attacker can have two cell phones, and they can place the two cell phones in the overlapping area of two neighboring cells. And suppose the two cell phones can, can, can communicate with each other, okay, for example, through um, a local area network or um, Wi-Fi. At the beginning of the attack, the top cell phone um, is admitted to the left cell, and the bottom cell phone is admitted to the right cell. And each of the two cell phones launches the attack that I showed you earlier. Okay, the, each of the cell phones tries to get as many scheduling slots as possible. So, so each of them can get about 20 continuous scheduling slots. Once one of them can't get any more scheduling slots, they begin to they, uh, hand over to the other cell. So which means that uh, so they attack, and once they can't get any more slots, 
this, they, each of them switches to the other um, cell. And then they repeat this attack uh, uh, once again. And then until each uh, one of them can't get any more slots, and they stop, and they, they, they switch again. Okay. So they can continue this forever. Um, then we measured the effective, effectiveness of this, this attack. Uh, so we ran a simulation for about 30 seconds um, to see of the 30 seconds, what's the percentage of scheduling slots that the two cell phones can get. Remember, there are two cell, remember, there are um, uh, at least one cell phone per cell. So we looked at uh, um, how many total slots that the attackers can get based on the number of attackers per cell. Remember, each cell has 50 users. So we learned that uh, if there is only one cell phone per cell, the cell phone can get about 80% of all the slots in that cell. Okay, so just one cell phone, one malicious cell phone out of 50 cell phones in a cell can get about 80% of all the scheduling slots. And if you increase the number of malicious cell phones in, the, in a cell to um, five, they, in total, they can get about 90%, more than 90% of all the scheduling slots in that cell. Uh, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, we made this simplistic, simplistic, simplistic assumption that the attackers knew the precise channel condition indicator of all the other cell phones. But this is not realistic. Most likely, the attackers do not know the channel condition indicators of other cell phones. So in this case, how can the um, attackers um, decide what channel condition quality to report? Well, remember that the attacker only needs to calculate the maximum ratio. Okay? They don't really care about the precise, um, the, um, the precise CQI. They only care about the maximum ratio. But the attacker does not know everyone else's ratio. Well, our solution is that uh, we let the attackers estimate the maximum ratio of all the other cell phones. And here's how we uh, estimate it. Um, suppose at a, uh, at a time slot, the maximum ratio among all the other cell phones is C of T. Now, from that point on, the malicious uh, the, the attacker can estimate future maximum ratios based on this formula. Now, this is very similar to the sliding window that you saw earlier. So if the attacker is scheduled, then we uh, increase the, uh, the estimated maximum by a rate of 1 over 1 minus epsilon. So this is based on the intuition that if the attacker is scheduled, then all the other cell phones are not scheduled. So which means that uh, um, the throughput of all the other cell phones will decrease because they're not scheduled. So therefore, that ratio will increase by, um, by uh, a constant factor. Okay, so this, that's the intuition base be behind this. Um, however, if the cell phone is not scheduled, then we, um, we, we, we modify the maximum ratio by this. I, I won't uh, go into detail of how we uh, arrived at this. Then we ran the simulation again for 30 seconds to see uh, how effective this attack remains if the attackers do not know the precise channel condition of all the other cell phones. Well, we learned that uh, in this more realistic condition, the attack is not as effective as in the ideal condition, but it's still pretty good effective. If there's only one attacker in every cell of 50 users, then this one attacker can get about 75 of all the scheduling slots. Whereas if there are five attackers in a cell, then the attackers can, in total can get about 80% of all the slots in the cell. Um, 
I mentioned that uh, we used an estim an esti uh, we used a formula to estimate the maximum uh, ratio among all the other cell phones. How good is our um, pr prediction? Well, so this graph shows you how good our prediction is. So um, the y-axis shows our prediction accuracy, uh, which means that uh, among all the predicted values, which of them are, are, are the correct uh, values. So we show that it doesn't matter how many attackers there are in the cell, our prediction accuracy consistently remains above 90%. Um, you have to look at uh, um, the effect of the, uh, the impact of the attack in terms of how many scheduling slots that uh, the attackers can get. But how does that translate to something that uh, ordinary people can understand? Um, in other words, how does that affect real applications? Well, so first we looked at the throughput. Before the attack, every cell phone in the cell gets about um, between 40 to 50 um, um, kilobit per second throughput, okay, assuming that every cell phone has the same, uh, has similar channel condition. However, after the, after the attack, if there's only one attacker uh, in a cell of 50 users, then that one attacker can get 1.5 megabit per second throughput, whereas all the other victim users get about 10 to 15 um, kilobit per second throughput each. Okay. So that's th that's about three times a drop. Yes. Um, do you get more uh, um, more bandwidth as there's more people, or is it less for you to see? Uh, there's a fixed amount of total bandwidth. Okay. Um, so each um, e each cell has a fixed total amount of bandwidth determined by uh, what frequency uh, they're using. But I mean, like the more users you have. Percentage of what? Users. Of, of the bandwidth. Uh, stolen by. That you can steal. Does it go down as you have more users added, added to the network? I see. So are you saying that if I have a hundred users in the network, uh, would it be harder for the attacker Could to you get? Still get 1.5? Yes, that's true. That's definitely true. However, um, on the other side, uh, the more users there are in a cell, the less bandwidth that a user gets to start with. So once the attack the attack happens. Each user, each victim user, will get even less bandwidth. Right. So, um, if your application depends on the availability of bandwidth and uh, the, um, the 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 the, the uh, amount of delay, then this what attack would affect uh, the victim users even more. It depends on the goal of the attacker. If the goal of the attacker is is just being selfish then, of course, the attacker wants to get as, as much bandwidth as possible. So in this case, you wish that uh, there are uh, fewer users in the cell. Right? So the fewer users there are in the cell, the more bandwidth the attacker can get. However, if the goal of the attacker is to um, wreak havoc in the network, then you wish that there are as many users in the cell as possible, because th that way you can, inf inf you can uh, um, um, adversely impact the, the, the victim users even more. OK, so we have looked at uh, the impact of the attack on the bandwidth. Um, but certain applications are delay sensitive. Okay. Um, so what's, what's the impact of the delay uh, of the attack? So before the attack, again, assuming uh, similar channel conditions of all, user, uh, of all mobile users, before the attack, there, is a, there are about 10 milliseconds average delay between two consecutive transmissions okay, of, uh, on, on every user. After the attack, where there, are, where there is one attacker in a cell of 50 users, um, oh, sorry, after the attack in a cell of 50 users, one attacker can cause uh, about 0.8 seconds of delay, whereas f five attackers can cause about 1.8 second delay. So how does this translate to the impact on applications? 
Well, a typical delay sensitive application is voice over IP. Um, voice over IP is very delay sensitive. Um, ideally, you want the delay to be less than uh, 100 milliseconds. If the delay is between 100 milliseconds and 400 milliseconds, it's tolerable. But your voice quality will degrade. Will degrade. However, if the delay is more than 400 milliseconds, um, people believe that uh, uh, the voice over IP application becomes useless. Okay. Well, now you can see that uh, if there's only one attacker in a cell of, of 50 users, the average delay is about uh, 800 milliseconds. That's way over the tolerable delay in, a view IP, in voice over IP applications. Uh, in the fourth generation cellular networks, uh, voice will be carried uh, over data. Okay. So, well, fortunately, currently, the, four, um, the 4G fourth generation cellular networks, um, they demand that the voice data have a higher priority than, uh, uh, than, than uh, other regular data. Okay. Um, but if they had not designed that in such a way, then you can, ha you can see what will happen. Because in that case, only one attacker in a cell of 50 users can disrupt all the VOIP applications. OK, so now we understand the impact of the attack. Um, what can we do about it? Uh, about it? We can try um, anomaly detection. Uh, we can uh, monitor the um, average throughput of every cellular user okay? uh, based on the assumption that uh, uh, no user should have the super good channel quality that it grabs more than, say, 50% of all the slots. Um, okay, but uh, what if there's a cell with only two users, and uh, one user has a better channel quality than another user? Well, you have to modify your anomaly detection algorithm to say that, okay, if there are less, fewer than five users, then that's okay. But if there are more than five users, then no user can grab more than this amount number, this amount of number of slots. Yeah, no matter what you do, you can always find some corner cases where you have to modify your rule again. Okay, so this is, you, it might help, but it's not an ideal solution. You can also try to uh, do anomaly detection based on the number of handoffs. Remember that the uh, um, persistent attack based on frequent handoff among different cells. Typically, this should not happen, right? Because you hand off only if typically we hand off when you when you drive, when you move. So you move from one cell to another. Um, so you can say that well, a cell phone can have more than one handoff per ten seconds. But then, what if uh, a cell phone happened to sit on um, in the overlapping area of two cells? And uh, due to some random interference, and suddenly one cell becomes better than the other. So this cell phone just uh, hands off very frequently, but not for a malicious reason. Okay, so you might have um, some false positive thinking that this cell phone is attacking your network, but whereas it really isn't. So you, you, once you start to do uh, anomaly detection, you get all into the, this, this, this very hairy area of how do you have a good rule that that, 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 that don't cause, cause a lot of false positives. Um, so we try to um, des devise an approach that does not have these problems, that solves the root of the problem. And even better, we wish to prevent this problem from happening in the first place. But remember, there are two vulnerabilities that are roots of the, the problem. The first is that uh, the base station does not verify the channel condition report by the cell phone. Well, we, we, do, we are not aware of anything that the base station can do to verify that. Right? Because you have to measure this cha channel condition at the location of the cell phone. Since the base station is not at the location of the cell phone, so there's nothing that, that's not much that the base station can do to verify the report. However, the second root cause is that um, um, the proportional fair algorithm does not guarantee fairness across all cells. It guarantees fairness only within a, a single cell. So therefore, if we can extend the proportional fair algorithm to guarantee fairness across all the cells, then we could have prevented this problem from happening in the, from happening in the first place. So the approach is very in intuitive. 
once a cell phone moves from one cell to another, its average throughput should move with it. Okay. And uh, this is not too difficult to, to implement because once a cell phone moves from one cell to another, some other information has to move with the cell phone as well, such as how many minutes it has, it, it has used from the previous cell. So we just want to add this additional information right, to move with the cell phone. You might think that this is so trivial, but it's not as trivial as I just described. Because you can just copy the average, the average throughput over. Because different cells may have different users. Um, intuitively, a cell in a cell with fewer users, each user will have a higher throughput, average throughput, than another cell with more number of users. Right. So when you move this average throughput over, you have to scale the average throughput by the number of users in the cell. Moreover, average throughput is also affected by the average channel condition in that cell. Because once channel condition gets better, throughput increases. So you also have to take into consideration the average throughput of a cell. Um, so we used this formula as an estimation of an average throughput in a cell. So this is the first term is the estimation of the instant instantaneous channel, channel quality. This term is a, the gain of that cell. Typically, people use a log n as a rough estimation of the gain. And here, n is the number of users in the cell. Um, so this is uh, the formula that we used to calculate um, the average throughput um, of a cell phone between two cells. Okay. So you plug in um, the, the formula from before, and remember that when a cell phone moves from one cell to um, the other, um, it's at the border of both cells. Right. So its channel quality should, ins its instantaneous channel quality should be similar in both cells. So therefore, these two terms cancel out, and uh, here's what you get. And uh, we know the number of users each, in each cell, and the gain is uh, approximated by a uh, log n. So we know how to calculate this value. And once we know the, if the user moves from cell A to cell B, uh, once we, since we know it's the user's uh, average throughput in cell A, then using this formula, we can calculate its average throughput in cell B. Okay, um, so um, our related work. Um, there have been some work on the looking at um, attacks on um, scheduling um, in cellular data networks. So there's this is one particular work from uh, Sprint Labs. Um, instead of attacking the scheduler by reporting false channel quality information, they do not modify the cell phone at all, but rather they try to um, attack scheduling indirectly by using bursty traffic from the application level. So what they do is that uh, they have two cell, two uh, laptops uh, connected to a test cellular network inside the Spring, uh, uh, Spring Labs. And uh, uh, one laptop is a victim user, the other laptop is an attacker. So the attacker will remain silent for a while, which me meaning that it does not send any traffic. And suddenly, this um, attack laptop sends very bursty um, HTTP traffic. So su this would cause the scheduler to give the attack laptop a lot of scheduling slots. Okay. So this would um, result in the, um, the starvation of the victim laptop. However, since they don't hand over, um, their attack is not that effective. Remember I said before that the fewer number of users in a cell, um, the less scheduling slots that the attacker can get. Right? So they only have two laptops in a cell. So that's the best situation. Um, well, oh, okay, so remember I said before that the fewer number of users in um, um, uh, the fewer number of users in a cell, 
the uh, less um, the less penalty that the users will get because the users will get more bandwidth to start with. Right? Um, so in this case, they have only two users in a cell. One one of them is an attacker. So in this way, uh, and and also because um, they are attacking the HTTP. Uh, oh, sorry, the, they are using HTTP to attack the the, the TCP uh, flow control. So once they send the burst of traffic, they can show that this would cause the TCP to time out. Okay. Since they are not directly modifying the reported channel quality, their attack is not would not be as effective as our attack. And also, since they don't do uh, the, the handover, so their attack cannot perpetuate. Uh, there are some other attacks on cellular data networks. Uh, on cellular networks, so there are attacks on the SMS. Uh, so this attack shows that uh, you can use SMS to uh, overwhelm the um, uh, patient channels. So patient channels is patient channel is a channel by which um, when you turn on your cell phone, um, well, your your um, well. So when you, when you, when you call a cell phone, if the cell phone is not active, then the, your your cellular network will use the patient channel to uh, find the cell phone. So they discovered that uh, you can send SMS messages to overwhelm um, the patient channel. And uh, there are also uh, attacks on the connection establishments. And uh, also includes our uh, previous work on attacking the battery power of cell phones using the internet. OK, so in conclusion, um, the, um, we, we, we think that uh, um, the fundamental flaw, a fundamental flaw in the design of the cellular networks is that uh, they grant unwarranted trust to mobile devices. And we discovered uh, two particular vulnerabilities in the proportional fare scheduler. One is that um, um, malicious cell phones can report fake channel quality information. The other is that uh, malicious cell phones can request handover. And when they do handover, their average throughput is not carried over with them. And we demonstrated that the attack can severely reduce the bandwidth and increase delay um, of all the uh, victim users. And they can, uh, essentially sh um, makes, they can essentially make the voice over IP application useless. And we proposed uh, an approach to enforce global fairness to uh, prevent the attack from happening in the first place. I will be happy to uh, take questions. I, uh, so I have a question. So the um, uh, I, I didn't get the, you know the justification why uh, you it is not a good solution to let the base station kind of limit the rate uh, like the time slots received by each cell phone. Uh, at any time, so I think that's kind of like a good uh, uh, kind of policing kind of policy. My second question is, uh, does this apply to both uplink and downlink? Ah, good question. Uh, let me answer the second question first. That's easier. So the question is that uh, does this attack apply to both uplink and downlink? No, this is this is only um, this only applies to the downlink, because only the downlink uses a pro uh, proportional fare um, uh, scheduling. Okay. But what does the up? What do they use for the uplink? I'm just curious. Um, they use for the, uh, well. Uh, let's see. What do they use for um, uplink? Um, I think uh, they don't. Uh, let's see. Uh, so f for downlink, once um, the the base station gets some data, outstanding data, the base station will decide who, uh, which cell phone to to send to. Uh, for uplink, I, I believe that. Uh, okay, I shouldn't give you wrong information. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, can, I can tell you offline, but I don't want to give you false information. Uh, the first question is that uh, why can't the base station um, have a limit on the bandwidth of each um, cellular, user, cellular users? Uh, the base station could do that, but once you do that, you begin to uh, interfere with the scheduling algorithm. So essentially, you're. you're putting additional constraints on the scheduling algorithm. Now, once you begin to do that, you, you, probably, you could violate certain properties that have been proved for this scheduling algorithm. OK, 
Okay, so when people design a scheduling algorithm, they have certain objectives, and they prove that uh, this algorithm satisfies those properties. But once you add additional constraints to that, then maybe those properties cannot hold anymore. Okay, so this is one problem. Another problem is that uh, it's hard to come up with a reasonable limit. Uh, it depends on how many users there are in the system, and also what are other, say, quality of service constraints. It's hard to get a number that, that, that's good in different scenarios. And sometimes slots may be just wasted in doing that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, other, other questions? Yes? Uh, so, so I wonder how sensitive the tag is to the correctness of the estimation of the this CQI, and also uh, how uh, whether the correctness depends on simulation parameters. So, if if the, maybe in real network, maybe the the other cell cell phone work, uh, have different situation at the simulation, then would the correctness drop significantly? Yes, uh, those are both excellent ex excellent questions. So, the first question is that uh, um, does the uh, effectiveness effectiveness of the attack depends on the, um, the the quality of the estimation of the CQI. Yes, definitely it does. It does. Um, think about it. The estimation tells the attacker what channel quality indicator to report. If the report is too low, then the attacker's ratio is not the highest, so the attacker won't get the next slot. If the estimation is too high, um, that doesn't really hurt. Because then the attacker can get, um, well, okay, so that could hurt because uh, the attacker will get the next slot, but uh, it can't utilize the high bandwidth, right? It's, it's, it's wasting its, uh, its average throughput because its, its throughput will, will be increased more than, uh, more than it, it needs to. Um, so, yes, so the first question is definitely yes. So that's why we measure the, the, we measure the accuracy of our estimation. The second question is that uh, does the quality of the estimation depend on our simulation parameters? Absolutely, it does. Um, however, in our simulation, uh, we simulated the channel quality of the victim users using a standard, um, a standard Rayleigh distribution, okay, which, as far as I know, is a, is a, is a typical, um, typical model when you try to uh, analyze the, the channel quality of different mobile users. Okay. Uh, yes, if, the, 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 um, if this model deviates from your actual situation, then yes, the quality of your estimation will, will, uh, will, 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 will change. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.